I haven't taken personally a prescription medication since somewhere around 1987. Wow. <laughs> right. I but asked for Greg. I'm, I'm not opposed to it. I just yeah. I don't yeah. need to. Right. Right. Um, and, and I'm 61. So I'm, I'm in the age where an average person my age is taking, you know, four, six, right? Like many, many prescriptions. And yep. the older you get, the more it gets stacked together. I don't think there's technologies, at least not that I'm aware of, that predictably would extend lifespan. But there are definitely ones available that look very promising to extend that period that we get to live healthy and live our life the way we want to live it. And that's one of the reasons when I first saw work on senolytics and senescence cells, I'm like, cool, this looks like one of those rare things that might actually extend that period where we get to live our life our way. Welcome back to the Medicine Podcast. My name is Mimi and I have my partner in everything, my my life partner, my spiritual husband with me here. What's going on, everybody? This is Chase. Excited today because we get to be students um, and we get to be fans because we have the director of product development from one of our favorite partners that we get to work with. This is Neurohacker Collective. Dr. Greg Kelly, welcome to the Medicine Podcast. Thanks, Chase and Mimi. I'm looking forward to our talk. Yeah, yeah. We've been looking forward to this interview because we've been taking neurohacker supplements, you know, for I don't know how many years. Chase started way back. He was an OG customer. Yeah, I'm like a decade in at this yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, I'm a little, little, little further behind, but at least five years. Um, and they've just been critical every time. We jump on an important podcast or we, you know, podcast together. I'm I'm on that quality of mind and it is I, I can tangibly feel connections in my brain happening faster and better. And I'm I'm really grateful that this is a product out there. So we are definitely um excited to talk and, and fangirling a little bit. <laughs> It's always wonderful to hear hear great testimonials like that. I know we put a lot of effort into designing and making products we really feel will make a difference yeah. so it's wonderful to you know have your support yeah yeah love it. and our audience is well aware of quality of mind we've talked about it for a long time as long as the show's been around um but recently and and i'm not exactly sure when uh senolytic came out or hit the marketplace but i've been taking it it, it really piqued my interest because of mostly the protocol for for taking qualia senolytic it's two days a month, which for me was very interesting because I'm burnt out on taking capsules. Taking handfuls of capsules, you get to the point where you're adding more and more and more, and all of a sudden you can't even fit the amount of capsules that you have in your hands on a daily basis from a, from your supplementation practice. And so what initially drew me to this was this sort of like rotational two day a month uh, supplementation protocol. And then after that peaking my interest, the conversation of aging, the conversation of senescence, which I'm hoping we can get into today, was something that was was really, really fascinating and not necessarily being addressed in the marketplace, at least from what I can see. And so I'm hoping today that we can get into not only the, the latest and greatest product from Neurohacker, but a little education around aging. And uh, so I, I'm hoping we can get into that. I think first, let's lay a little context would love to hear what you do in the world today, as well as specifically what your role of director of product development looks like at Neurohacker. Sure. So as director of product development, really most of my day is spent reading, research, talking to, you know, smart people that, you know, know a bit about, you know, whether it's nootropic sup supplements or ingredients like quality of mind, longevity. Um, you know, following other experts. And then periodically I get to do cool things like talk to people like the two of you. <laughs> and then I create a lot of content for our social media people, you know, um, edit most of what um, goes through them. So I, I feel like in many ways I have the coolest job ever. I get to, you know, stay up to date, learn, do fun things like you know i went to rhythmia this summer oh nice to, get to talk about the brain on psychedelics wow and, yeah cool. so good life <laughs> yeah yeah i love that so 
specifically with um, the product development side, you're also uh, an ND, correct? Yeah. So um, my career trajectory went um, U.S. Navy. So they paid for my undergraduate, which was in engineering. Did my um, active duty about five and a half years, including originally being stationed in your current home, um, Coronado. And then when I got out, I, um, for lack of a better way to describe it, just thought, oh, well, I'm going to get rid of everything except a backpack and be a gypsy and just wander the <laughs> earth, right? Like like the old Kung Fu character in that 70s show. Right. And um, made it as far as Hawaii, University of Hawaii, and decided, well, I'm heading to Asia. Let me you know, at least get a baseline of a little bit of language background. So I started taking Thai language at that time. It, I knew that for me to do what I wanted to do, I had to be able to do really well or in the self-care domain, right? Like take care of myself because I didn't, you know, I wasn't expecting to you know, check into hospitals or whatever. So I started really, you know, doing a lot of my free time learning about, you know, herbal medicine, traditional medicine, acupuncture. And in that couple year window, before I really got too far along my journey, I stumbled on naturopathic medicine right. and and almost immediately course changed. Ended up in the first class of what's now called Sonoran College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona um, and graduated in 96. So Love that. Um, we, cool. was in practice for a while um, with, I don't know if you've ever or are familiar with um, the blood type diet, Dr. Okay. D. Dama. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I saw all the new patients in his practice for about three years after his book first hit in the, in the late 90s. And, you know, have worked in and out of the supplement world, have worked with patients, have worked in corporate wellness. So I've, um, you know, I feel like I've got a pretty diverse background in natural medicine, supplements, and honestly, what really works, because that's, you know, what matters to me and ultimately people I've worked with and our listeners today. Well, and, and quite honestly, that's what's always a attracted me to neurohacker is I, I worked in the supplement space for a while myself and while i have no scientific background it's more in business you know operations and finance and accounting i've been able to see enough and my personal passion my my very bro -y approach at science um has you know given me enough tools to be able to smell out you know garbage supplements for the most part and um rarely do you find in the supplement space a, an organization a group of people that are so leaned into cutting edge science and are ensuring that their team includes individuals like yourself. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the ethos of Neurohacker and what goes into, what rigor goes into making these products that, that we know and love and also can validate for mm -hmm. the level of intention and scientific support that goes into making these. Yeah, so um, I think the, the easiest way to understand NeuroHacker co Collective and products we create is we want our products to be experienced. So we want people to, to take them and feel a difference. And maybe not everyone will feel it, but Qualia Mind would be an archetype of that, right? The goal was for most people, they'll take Qualia Mind and if not feel it that day, certainly within you know four or five days. And so that was the guiding thing. And, and we started with the brain with nootropic, so qualia mind, um, or OG qualia that um, preceded that, because the general sense of the founders was the biggest limitation to people showing up and being our best selves. And then, you know, the I guess the spinoff from that is the world's a bit better place is our brain. And um, if our brain has more resources, you know, is able to do its job better, we show up being better and then the world's better. So that's that's really where things started. And then the collective idea was the we is smarter than me. Bad. The the founders, you know, people like me as well. We have connections to people that aren't really, you know, daily workers at Neurohacker Collective, but are experts in their domain and being able to tap into that collective intelligence for things. And so that's that's really where the, the like the neurohacker was like, let's start with biohacking the brain, the collective, let's reach out to smart people and get their input on how we should approach this. And that stayed true to date. And then in terms of what we do, and um, and I would lead this is, um, you know, so we are one of our most recent products is a gut brain scoopable powder. So um, Qualia Symbiotic is the name. So it's a, a blend of prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics. And what 
we start is we'll try to learn a lot about the, that system, the gut brain. Like, what are the important mechanisms? What are the key concepts? What what are the leading people doing? And from that, I'll usually generate a list of say somewhere about seventy to one hundred ingredients that I think merit you know reading the research on, and then. I'll read those, you know, so and then create a document on each um, that summarizes each study, the good and the bad, right? Because a lot of things were were that are touted in the supplement world, you know, don't, in the studies they don't really show much. So each ingredient at the end of that process gets rated one to five. One's like, LOL, who in their right mind would ever pay money for this, right? LOL. <laughs> right. Five's like, like this is a this is a star, right? This could be like a you know a, a, what the supplement world might call a hero ingredient, but this would be a foundational thing we'd likely want in this product. And and then a lot of things end up you know threes and fours, so you know not not things, but you know is is there value there for that ingredient? Which there may be, there may not be. And then after that process is done, then really the hardest thing is all right. Let's make a decision to put something together from the ingredients we think are the best that's going to actually solve the problem we set out to address and then the last step after that and i think this is relatively unique to neurohacker is we'll actually make up enough of that product to give people and do a study wow uh, and if it if it tests out well which quality symbiotic to test it out exceptionally as an example we in that that stage we measured a range of gi health gi performance things in about 50 people and we saw over it was roughly three weeks of dosing about a 60 to 70 percent improvement across the board wow. in every area mm. so it's like all right well this like it, it works right so everything you know up to that stage is ultimately to get to that point like did it actually make a difference when we gave this finished product to real people and if it passes the thumbs up there, then it moves into production and goes for sale. So that's our process. And it takes a long time to go yeah. through that. Like imagine I'm really efficient. I can get through like, you know, an ingredient a day if I'm, you know, really cooking on taking quality of mind, you know, and um, but you know, some of the other people that work with me, the same ingredient might take them three or four days to get through and rate. So, you know, it's it's months doing the research. It's, you know, you know, a couple more months doing the study phase. And and then, it's you, really unique. And, and yeah. I can assure you of that. I mean, there we're in a sea of supplement brands and there's copycat brands on Amazon, you know, mm -hmm. wherever you look. And it's quite literally the opposite of what you're doing, which is a heavy R&D process and, and quite literally rolling it out to people and getting that feedback. It's It's usually like a host of keyword searches, trending ingredient names, industry reports. Yeah. Um, the most affordable, not quality, but the most affordable sourcing. With well, snappy marketing. Snappy marketing, enough, you know, search engine optimization function in the ingredient list or the formula list to warrant bringing a product to market. And so that's a lot of times what you're finding in the supplement space. And this is quite literally the opposite where there's efficacy and quality and some level of feedback at, at the baseline. I mean, the way I just parse it is formulator is often the name for people that do at least a subset of what I do. Yeah. And we've struggled to find a formulator. Most formulators are more marketing based. Right. They'll, all right, this is the claim I want to make. What vendor do I know that says they have an ingredient yeah. that we can make this claim? You know, let me contact them. And so I'm routinely told by the vendors that I'm among the only people of their customers that read the studies they send and I'll, I'll grill them on them right i'm yeah i'm discerning so it, it's tough for me to give something a five mm, that's so interesting i love that you guys take the research backed approach and that you're you're literally combing through the research and then you know how do you approach once you parse out these you know ingredients that could be hero ingredients what about the combinations because you guys are are known for for including a lot of ingredients uh at least, correct me if i'm wrong here but at least from my understanding uh, there's a lot of ingredients in one product which is why it's sometimes multiple capsules like three four five six capsules so can you go into the process of like then how do you know like how these ingredients are going to behave together that approach is almost a 
like what I would think of as a systems approach, right? So senescent cells, which we'll talk about a little bit in Senolytics, the original work on what became known as senolytic compounds was done jointly by Mayo Clinic and Scripps Institute of Aging in Florida. And what they did is they're like, okay, let's understand senescent cells and what they do to hang out in tissues. So think of senescent cells, this is like oversimplification, as cells that are past their use-by date and still hanging around. So imagine your refrigerator, you know, you have a bunch of healthy, fresh, vibrant food, and then some things sitting in the corner that should have been thrown out a long time ago. Those are your senescent cells, right? So there's certain strategies that senescent cells use to hang out in your refrigerator. Those would be the mechanisms. And what Mayo and Scripps originally did is, well, let's find compounds that correct those mechanisms so that these things now wouldn't just be hiding in your refrigerator. We could actually find them and throw them away. Yeah, I mean. And they then identified a subset of things, tested out a couple. One of the strongest was something called quercetin, which I'm sure both of you are familiar with. It's been around the supplement world for um, many, many years. Um, the other one was a, a pharmaceutical medication that's um, an immune modulator um, medication. And what they then found is, oh, like quercetin worked in, say, endothelial cells, but not fat tissue. And this other one worked in that tissue, but not endothelial cells. They had you know different mechanisms. Let's see what happens when we stack them together. And that you know, tested out to be the combination much better than either individually. So... It, that's hard, right? Like you're making a yeah. lot of you know guesses based on mechanisms, things that you would expect. Okay, this is doing this, this is doing something different, or this is in this tissue, this is in that tissue. And at the end of the day, you're left with, okay, this is our best guess. And that's why we do that last step of testing out the entire recipe. You know, does the entire recipe do what we wanted it to do? Because yeah. without that step, you know, some things may actually be more canceling each other out or, you know, aren't as additive. And so, I mean, there's no perfect way of knowing, right? Right. Well. And it's why I think that ultimately when you make complicated products, the burden is on us to make sure that it works and that it's safe, right? Because you right. want that first and foremost. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, well, we're teasing it already, uh, senescent cells and, and senescence. So let's get into the conversation of, of aging. Some in our culture don't want to age at all and go to ungodly measures to prevent aging, right? We've, especially in Southern California, you see it everywhere. Um, but what about healthy aging? Like I'm, I'm under the opinion that many of us should embrace aging. It's inevitable and there's actually a beauty in it and a, it, it's associated with wisdom in a lot of cases. And if we deny aging, maybe we're denying wisdom and Jesus, maybe that's half the problem of the world anyway. <laughs> But there still is a way to do this um, without premature aging, without, um, you know, falling to the environment and the conditions of our world that would, you know, make our uh, bodies and minds feel significantly older than they, they should be. And so I'm hoping that you can unpack a little bit about aging, what is happening to us what does healthy aging look like and what does it not look like? I think like in a general sense, I think a good way to think about aging is, you know, we have our birth age. So that would be chronological age is how science would, would name it. And, you know, then we have what's sometimes called perceived age. So that's, you know, when I look at, you know, you, how old do I think you are? Right. And if you get enough people to do that, you know, if you, if your perceived age is less than your chronological age, that's a really good thing, right? Like that predicts, you know, healthier aging. Another would be felt age. So that's, yeah. you know, you know, Greg, how old do you feel? Uh, almost everyone's going to feel younger. Than yes. Yeah. Biological <laughs> age, right? So that's maybe less predictable. And then there's something which would be more biological age, right? So that's, let's test your biology and see how old that looks, right? So that's, there's been, you know, cottage industry, like the true diagnostics, DNA methylation, yeah. task, things like grim age, things like that. And then there's functional age, right? Like, can you still function at a younger level? So like in a general sense, when I think of aging, I always think, okay, there's how old your you know birth certificate says you are. And then there's those other, you know, ages. And the goal is always to be less in those other areas than our age. Right. And some of that, some people will just luck into that with genetics, some because they've done, you know, 
majority of good, healthy choices, you know, starting at an early age, maybe, you know, they're on a great track. A lot of people will hover somewhere, you know, like, you know, maybe some of those ages are older, like that's always worse, right? When your people perceive you to be older <laughs> than you are, right? right? Not good. Um, and so the goal is to then, you know, implement strategy. So at least my goal would be to, no matter what my birth age says I am, to be healthier and more able to do the things that are most important to me. And I, I don't know if you would know this, but there was a recent study, um, a big study, and it looked at people 60 years older than you know aging through mortality. And what it found is the average for the group in general was that about 25% of their years after 60 were spent in you know, nursing home facilities, um, assisted living, or in a state where they really couldn't do you know, much in terms of live the life they had lived before. So that would be the expectation, right? No matter how many years we get to live after about 60, about a quarter of them aren't healthy years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it's easy for me to say in my 30s, but I want to be like, if, if, you're, if you're miserable in your uh -huh. 60s, 70s and 80s, and you actually distilled it down to like having vitality in those years, and you're only counting like four of the 20 or 30 years of life that that you would qualify as feeling vital. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, that sounds like not a world that I want to live in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if I'm correct, our lifespan is increasing in general on average for men and women, but the quality of life is decreasing. Is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. So it was increasing until uh, up until the last couple of years. It's oh, actually... Sure started to to decrease a, a little so it's not quite as high in general women live a couple of years longer than men on average when i worked corporate wellness you know one of the things was pharmacy spend and i i, I haven't taken personally a prescription medication since somewhere around 1987 wow <laughs> right but that's for great i'm i'm not opposed to it i just yeah. i don't yeah. need to right right um and and i'm 61 so i'm i'm in the age where an average person my age is taking you know four six right like many many prescriptions and yep. the older you get the more it gets stacked together right and so it, that approach to managing symptoms leads to what you suggested Mimi. like people spend a lot of their latter years you know in a very unhealthy state. And so I don't think there's technologies, at least not that I'm aware of, that predictably would extend lifespan. But there are definitely ones available that look very promising to extend that period that we get to live healthy and live our life the way we want to live it. And that's one of the reasons when I first saw work on senolytics and senescence house, I'm like, cool, this looks like one of those rare things that might actually extend that period where we get to live our life our way. Yeah. So take us take us through that. You used the beautiful analogy already of these senescent cells being like the hidden uh, grocery items that have passed their expiration in the refrigerator and that we are to uh, look for them and pull them out of hiding so that we can, you know, exfoliate them or remove them from our refrigerator. But but tie that tie that with aging. What does what does senescence look like uh, as it pertains to this aging arc? Yeah, so the word senescence really means aging in, in a simple sense. Um, when we think of like the senolytics, that's cellular senescence. So those are like aged cells. Right. So think of um, cells live and die their own lives. Um, so all of our cells pretty much have life cycles independent of our, our overall life. Um, with the exception of neurons, we don't replace neurons. The, the ones we're born with are the ones we'll die with. Retinal cells are the same, but every other tissue cells are constantly being birthed, living their life, and then passing away to be replaced by new, healthy, young cells. Um, and that varies tissue by tissue. So something like heart tissue, an average cell may live four decades, crazy long time. Muscle tissue, maybe 15 years, that tissue about eight. Liver, maybe like three but you start to get to intestinal lining cells, like they're turning over every week. So mm -hmm. there, there's these you know processes all going on. And so the bottom line is tens of billions of cells are being replaced on a daily basis, just varying. And so what a senescent cell is, is one that somewhere during its life cycle got so stressed, it's like, all right, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> 
I'm yeah. not going to make new copies of myself. So I'm not going to have any children's cells and I'm unrepairable. So I'm just going to mark myself for, you know, eventually going through this, you know, like, um, it's called apoptosis, but the process of, you know, being taken out of the refrigerator and thrown out. But what happens when we're young, the senescent cells that are created tend to be visible in the refrigerator, right? So the immune system can find them if they don't on their own kind of fall off, fall off and then take them out, get rid of them. But as we age for a variety of reasons, they're less visible to the immune system and the immune system struggles to find them. So because of that, they just slowly accumulate and accumulate. So think of your refrigerator announced that having one or two spoiling items hidden in the back, <laughs> you have shelves or, you know, like an entire shelf that's got these items. And not only are, is that problematic because fundamentally the health of tissues is reliant on the health of cells in the tissue. So if more and more aren't functional, but are still taking up space and resources, that's problematic. But the other thing, and it's why sometimes senescent cells are referred to as zombie cells. Right. There's a combination of that. They didn't die, right? They didn't, you know, go finish that journey to sell your death, but they can cause nearby items to also spoil. Really? Which in, in, in our tissues, what that means is they turn nearby healthy cells into other senescent cells. So no, that's, no, that's no. sometimes called secondary senescence. But like imagine something in your refrigerator that was spoiled now causing everything nearby to spoil as well. And so that's why we need to do things to remove them from the refrigerator, because not only are they causing a problem, they're going to cause problems for healthy cells. So what happens if they go completely unaddressed? If if, so, if if the refrigerator is starting to smell bad, what does that mean in the human body? And this is relatively new ish science. You know, so around 2000, like senescence has been known about in a cellular context since about 1961. So I was born in 1962. So just before my my birthday. But it wasn't until the early 2000s that their role in unhealthy aging started to become clear. And since then, there's almost no tissue and no health condition that increases with progressing age that's not made worse by senescent cells. So, you know, whether that's mm -hmm. heart function, like a common thing with aging is, you know, called anabolic resistance. But, you know, our, our muscles get weaker and don't respond to anabolic stimuli like weightlifting in the same way as a 25 year or 30 year old. And that's at least largely caused by senescent cells there. And if you remove those senescent cells, then that older muscle tissue responds much more like young muscle tissue. Real. So joints would be another area, like super common thing as people get older, even by the you know, early forties in a lot of people is that, you know, even if they want to exercise, it's uncomfortable because of how their joints are performing. Sure. Yeah. And a lot of that is because think of like what should be happening at our, our joints is stem cells with, you know, any trauma should make new, healthy young joint cells. And what happens as we get older, it's almost like a layer of these senescent cells overlaps that and prevents them from doing their job. You know, so joints is another area that are very affected, but really every tissue. So, you know, a lot of skin system or skin <laughs> symptoms with aging, right? Like the you know, wrinkles, you know, very visible. It's, it's often what makes um, us judge someone as older is, you know, not only wrinkles, but the, the almost the glow, right? The luminescence of someone's skin and senescent cells impact that, um, you know, immunity, like a big challenge with people that, and we saw this with, um, you know, the epidemic a few years ago, right? Is that it affected older people much more than younger people because their immune systems were also right. had, um, what would be thought of as senescent immune cells, right? So, so really anything you can think of that is a common challenge with aging. Um, I'm not aware of any to date that senescent cells haven't been found to play a role and not to say the entire role, but they, they contribute sure. across wow. the board. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like on the whole, we need to, like our body needs to have the, the optimal level of immune surveillance and surveillance in general to rid the body of or, or to to make active to to optimize the the taking out the garbage right around the body and this is this is every system this is nature this is mushrooms that are decomposing you know fallen trees this is what we see in nature is this constant like death and life cycle and when that cycle gets disrupted for whatever reason things are going to break down um so that just it just makes so much sense that we need this 
taking out the garbage action in our body. And man, it seems like in our modern world, we, we've we talked about this many times, you know, uh, just us and on the podcast. It seems like being optimally healthy sometimes is like a full-time job in the modern world. If you're out in the woods and you're a hermit, you're probably living a great, you know, great life. Your cells are probably, you know, on fire. Your immune surveillance is probably on point. But living near a city, um, being busy, entrepreneurs, individuals that have, you know, high levels of stress. Um, can you speak to some of the things that modern consumers, modern people have to deal with that may get in the way of this garbage process being taken out. Just before we touch on that, so one of the main causes of senescence accumulation is what would be thought of as premature stress-induced senescence. But fundamentally, a whole variety of stressors can turn a healthy cell into a senolytic or a senescent cell, right? So modern stresses are certainly contributing. And so UV exposure, as an example, would be something, if it's too extreme, would cause a healthy cell to become senescent. Um, you know, radiation of any form, you know, nutrient stress, you name it. So stress is super important. Um, and I'll give the analogy that I used in my book and often have used with patients. But when I was a kid, so I had, a, you know, five brothers and sisters. And one of the games we got sometime in the late 60s was called The Last Straw, I believe. I always It's sometimes called The Camel Game. But for the audience, picture this plastic camel there's a, a bucket on each side and each team takes a turn spinning a wheel and the wheel has different colors. So maybe it points to blue or red or, and each color is a straw of a different, you know, thickness and weight. And so whatever yours is, you have to put that, you know, so, you know, I spin, I get the blue straw and I put that in my bucket and, you know, Mimi spins and she gets the red and she puts the red one in and there's so many other straws now the the back collapses. Really? Right. So to me, that's the perfect analogy for stress. So like science would call those straws allostatic load, right? And then the camel's back would be our resilience, Nine. right? And each individual straw would be like a stressor. And so in the modern world, we are all ca carrying around a certain amount, of, like in many cases, shared straws, right? You know, we both live in San Diego. I live by the ocean. So my air quality is generally excellent, right? So that's not a straw for me, but... You know, when the Santa Ana's just came the other day and my phone was giving air quality war warnings, right? Now that was a new stressor, right? Um, Didn't, not a lingering one. But um, the way I tend to think about stress is that, that, like we all carry straws. There's certain ones there's not much we can do about. There's others, there may be something we can do about if we're really diligent biohackers. And, and there's other ones that are relatively removable with not a lot of work. And then we can also always do things to build our resilience, you know, make it so that we can carry more, more straws. So that's the game for me. Like, all right, what can I do to make my back more resilient? And what are the most removable straws with the least amount of effort? But let's at least oh, focus on those. Yeah, right? And so those are things like in the, and not to say any of these are easy, but not getting enough sleep is a big straw for many people, right? And some it's yeah. just neglect, right? They're not scheduling enough time to sleep. And you know, some biohackers, and, and I tend to believe this as well, we probably need a little bit more sleep entering this time of year when days are getting shorter than we did in the summer. So are you budgeting that into your schedule? You know, food quality, right? Some, I think some food may make us more resilient, others definitely a straw, right? So are we removing that? I, I tend to put supplements, you know, at least chosen wisely into the resilience bucket. They can, you know, adaptogens, you know, some of the mushrooms you mentioned earlier um, for our immune system and other things they can make us more resilient so that's the goal always like you know like let's not make people neurotic and you know have them spend a whole bunch of time on things where even with a ton of work they might not be able to remove that straw like it's stressful even knowing about that straw right when you can't do much about yeah. it right let's just worry about the like the low-hanging fruit here so that's how i approach it yeah that's really great i love the love the analogy that mm -hmm. that really resonates how do you know what signs are there that you may be accumulating senescent cells? Would this show up on, you know, is this something that you can just observe in yourself? You mentioned joint pain, um, but what does it look like if you're getting blood work done? Or is it impacting your sex hormones or your ability to have children, your fertility? 
How does this typically show up? It can be really variable, I okay. guess would be the best way to describe it. So think of senescent cells as more of a category than a single thing. Okay. And so a senescent cell and fat tissue may be very similar to one in joint tissue, but maybe not exactly the same. And because you had a high amount in joint, doesn't necessarily mean you'd have that same degree of high amount oh. in fat tissue. So what you're really looking for is function of that tissue. So with fat tissue as, as an example, as senescent cells accumulate, you'd start to see much more of the metabolic obesity things, right? The high blood sugar, the insulin resistance, things like that. Things that are spun off inflammation. Because one of the things that, that senescent cells do to turn nearby healthy, you know, good food to spoiled food is they secrete inflammatory compounds into that microenvironment. With joints, you'd see, you know, like, um, you know, starting to lose flexibility, pain on movement, you know, uncomfortableness, you know, walking upstairs, bending, things like that. Um, and um, so with each tissue, it's it's just whatever the function of that tissue would be. And then the other thing is there's no great um, lab test currently. There's, you know, labs I know that are working diligently to see if they can come up with a good lab test um, that would, in the blood, give a sense of what's happening in tissues because that's the, the key thing right like since senescent cells are in tissues there's no great way to tell in blood what's going on in a variety of tissues um, so really it's function is what you look at and then you can just assume that in most tissues they're going to just progress up in somewhat of a uh, ascending and ramping so not a straight line like an accelerating curve over time starting somewhere you know, in some tissues, maybe as early as late 20s, if we've done something to really stress that tissue out a lot. And in others, you know, by mid 30s, for sure, you'll start to accumulate more and more. And and so a, an analogy, our, our head of marketing is a gardener. So, you know, I'm sorry to mix metaphors here, but she, you know, so I had to explain it to her in a gardening sense. And just think of, you know, in your garden, there'll be some plants that develop, you know, a yellowing leaf or two. You, typically those will fall off, right? That would be a senescent cell just going through its entire life cycle and falling off. And in a young person, that happens commonly. As we get older, the yellowing leaves don't fall off. They stay on the plant. And so that's why a gardener is needed to periodically yeah. prune, sure. right? And so the goal is to, like I think of many health things in that camel last straw analogy. We, we want to keep whatever it is below the threshold where we're in jeopardy of health collapsing. So the goal of senolytics isn't necessarily to take them after your joints are a problem or after you know you have a you know a large degree of anabolic resistance in your muscles or cognitions you know really going into a tailspin. It's to prune them and keep them low well before that. Yeah, it, it makes total sense in, you know when you think about something like Alzheimer's which doesn't just start when you're 75 or 80. I think, you know, the 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 latest research is showing that it can start, you know, 20, 30, 40 years prior based on lifestyle and certainly some genetics, but in large part lifestyle. And so it's important for us to think about these things, although in our 20s and, you know, early 30s and before kids, certainly you feel almost invincible. You're not necessarily thinking about is my body optimally, you know, taking out the garbage and, and pruning the le the yellow leaves? Like it's not necessarily something that we're thinking about because we generally feel pretty good. And then it takes a signal. It takes the pain teacher showing up in the body in the only way that your body can communicate with you, which is by symptoms and showing you like, hey, I need some support here. So this is really great that this is, you know, this conversation will support so many people and certainly us like we're trying to live long, healthy, happy, fulfilling, disease-free lives. And if there are small actions that we can take on a daily basis to stack the deck in our favor to achieve that dream, I am all for it. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we, I think, overcomplicate things where where we think that health has to be so complicated and it ha because we don't see a lot of like truly healthy people out there who are like thriving. Um, you know, in later in years. And um, yeah, so it's just making me think like these lifestyle factors that we can lean into when we're young 
Um, before we jump into you know more details about Senolytic and the supplement specifically, what are, in your opinion, some of these lifestyle factors, these small actions that we can take on a regular basis to stack the deck in our favor to achieve a long, happy, healthy, disease-free life? So I'll just go in the order I would have taught them when I taught nutrition, because I used to just each lecture kind of tackle a new thing. But I would start with sleep, but right? it's it's among the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and it's you know super important for metabolic health, you know, our willpower to even exercise the next day, right? Our food choices are typically less good if we don't <laughs> get enough sleep too, right? So it impacts that. So sleep is often like I I tend to think like let's take the Tai Chi approach. Like what's the like if we try to take weight head on, that's a, a lot more challenging often than if we start, as an example, sleeping more and pounds melt off on their own, right? That's to me a better place. Um, body clock would be was my next lesson when I taught nutrition to naturopathic students. Um, you know, are, are we doing things in a way that's living with nature cycles, both like daily for women, you know, monthly and then all of us seasonally? or trying to live against those, right? You know, so, you know, like the biohacking, you know, orange lens glasses, if you're on screens after sunset, right? I've been doing that personally since probably about 2005. No. So, and, and you know, I don't do it every night. I, I don't, like I've known biohackers that wear those everywhere. Like I just use mine if I'm at home. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't have to bring them with me to a restaurant or something like body, my body is resilient enough. Um, but anyways, things to work on the strength of our body clock, because that's what drives a lot of function. Like a, a good analogy for the listeners to, I, I think, lock away is the analogy would be like, imagine going into the darkest closet in your home right now and now lighting one candle. Like, wow, big difference, right? Mm -hmm. Now imagine going into that same closet. There's already 99 candles lit and you light one more. Like Maybe don't even notice it. Right. So one candle is meaningless. It's the change in something that our senses are designed to pick up, whether that's our external sensors like our eyes, ears, feelings of touch, taste, you name it, or receptors on ourselves. So we always want to create like proportional change. And that's what circadian rhythms do when they're robust, right? It'll be a big surge of cortisol, seven to nine a.m. and then close to none at midnight. Melatonin would be the opposite. So when we have really strong circadian rhythms, it takes care of a lot of those like proportional change of hormones and other things. So all we need to do is work on getting good light and dark exposure, good meal timing, and the system will take care of most of the rest. And then exercise would be another crazy important one. And I would say take a portfolio approach, right? Do something to maintain balance and flexibility, something for strength, something for endurance, right? Just, and you don't need to go crazy on those, like two days a week of each. Right. 20 minutes is probably going to get you, you know, uh, what's the, you know, the 80 20 rule, maybe even more than 80 20. So I'm always looking what's the best investment. Um, so, um, and then often what happens in the more extreme ends of, you know, people pursuing health, they're spending a lot of time pursuing that extra five or 10%. And for, for me, that's not personally worth it. I, there's a lot of other things I'd like to do with that all that yeah. time. <laughs> so it's, you know, what's the minimal effective dose would be another way yeah. of describing it for a thing. And then just remember a lot of the things that full-time biohackers are doing, they're not working a job and other things. So a lot of what they're doing are hormetic stressors, things that a low amount are stressful, but when stacked together, they're, they're, you know, they're low level stressors. They're filling their bucket. Their bucket doesn't have some of the other straws you and I would have because of having, you know, maybe full-time jobs, family dynamics that are going on that are stressful, you name it. So don't compare yourself to what these, you know, the influencers do are doing. Yeah. They're in a different context than you. And we don't want to stack stressors, right? Because yeah. what ends up happening, the most common presentation when I was in practice of someone showing up with a new diagnosis, right? And often one that the medical field wasn't able to address well, right? You know, like chronic fatigue, Lyme disease, things like that, is that I was healthy until. Right, right, and, right. right. And they're, they're right. They're like, they're identifying really accurately that last heavy straw that caused the back to flap. 
But what was true is the bucket was already precariously full to such an extent that that last straw collapsed it. So the goal to me is, you know, what are those straws we can, like I said, the low hanging fruit straws (laughs) that we can do something about because we want to keep our, but we never know when the world around us is going to dump a big, heavy straw in our laps. Yeah, so true. So we want to make sure that we're resilient and have you know as much space in our basket as possible. And that's why I think pruning senescent cells early, you know, like what makes sense to me, right? Like they're a straw. Let's do what we can, you know, without you know going crazy about investing tons of time into it, which you know, you had mentioned earlier one of the things that intrigued you originally was it's just two days a, a month that you have to take capsules. So, yeah. So let's let's get into it. I, I would love to learn more about how qualia Synolytic is is doing what it's doing i started taking this back in the spring and uh we live up in idaho in the summers and lots of water skiing what always comes with that for me is like i get a few weeks of joint pain because it's a new exercise modality there's a lot of tension when you're water skiing i end up skiing with one arm in lots of cases and elbows my shoulders chase goes really hard and one of the things that i (laughs) noticed was that i wasn't having this joint pain that i also ended up finding myself in deeper sleep, um, generally waking up, even my HRV when I was um, checking my whoop band was improved. And it was, it, this was after having been on Synolytic for a couple months. And of course I'm doing other things and I'm always trying to moderate my story. Uh, our listeners are familiar with. I was working a very intense job and trying to do all the Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield things and ended up in adrenal exhaustion. Um, just complete hormone disruption at 27 and uh, had to totally reshape the way that I move my body, manage stress, all of the things you talk about, sleep, sunlight, circadian rhythms, diet at the right time. And so that was my journey. But and so I'm constantly on this, this, this world of not too much, not too little, all the while looking for cutting edge supplementation. So I would love if you could unpack a little bit about what went into the formulation, what are, what are synolytics and how do they actually support the exfoliation, if you will, of, of senescent cells and uh, unpack a little bit of what's actually going on here with this product. Yeah. So going back to our refrigerator analogy, so the definition of senescent cells are things that, res- are like the lingering senescent cells that are problematic with aging, are things that resist a- apoptosis. So they've figured out a way to basically not get thrown out of the refrigerator. And then th- as the immune system gets older, it's less good at finding them. But what some researchers think is that that even when we make senescent cells, say at 20, there might be a subset of them that were invisible to the immune system. So if they didn't get thrown out, they're just like, we look in the refrigerator, we don't see them, even though they're smelling up the joint. So senolytic compounds are things that recapitulate that journey to apoptosis. They, they fundamentally normalize that the cell mechanisms. So when things are weighed, like, oh, should I go through and complete this journey to, you know, essentially apoptosis means the cells breaks apart in a really organized way. Should I do that? Should I not do that? A senescent cell is currently in the I show uh, I won't do it camp, and a senolytic is something that causes it to change its mind. Um, right, and so that, that's it, like we could go into lots of mechanisms, but that's really what it boils down to. It's always a weighing game. Like should I, shouldn't I? And all you need to do is toggle it a little bit in the should I, and now it'll finally go through that journey, break apart, and the immune system then just gobbles up the debris and recycles it. So you had Mimi talked a bit earlier more of, you know, like nature and recycling. So that's what happens, right? Like senescent cells, when they go through that process, aren't detoxed, you know, through our lungs, skin, you name it. They're just like a, a leaf that falls into the soil. And now that's turned into nutrition to grow new healthy plants. So that's what happens. Mm-hmm. And then certain compounds are more active in some tissues than others. So I mentioned early the original work by Mayo with quercetin, they found it was really active in endothelial cells, as an example. So those, those are the cells that line our arteries and our lymph system and things like that. Um, but it wasn't active or very active in fat tissue. And about three years after that research was published, the same group um, identified Fisetin, sometimes called fisetin. So it's another polyphenol compound. Um, they're both actually yellow 
very yellow. They were both used as yellow dyes you know, way back. Um, and it turned out fisetin was was more versatile. It was both stronger and worked in tissues that quercetin didn't, right? So there would be a complementary aspect of using both together. And then eventually after that, piperlongamine, which is found in an Ayurvedic plant, piperlongam, it's, it's a relative of black pepper. Right. Um, that was found to work in a very different way than those compounds. Um, you know, so that, you know, this was probably around 2018, there started to be this buzz in the longevity forums, like, oh, what, wouldn't it be cool to stack some of these things together? And at the time, piperlongamine just fundamentally wasn't available. I, no. I don't think anyone, uh, until we found someone to make it for us, I don't think that, I, I, I don't know of any concentrated way to have done that. And then other things like curcumin, as an example, there's branded curcumin. That's um, the tagline is the cognitive curcumin. Right. Right? It's it was developed by neuroscientists to get you know more into the brain. You know, so um, curcumin is a senolytic compound. Usually, it would be more in the joints and connective tissue, but you know we want to give the brain support, right? So we put that into the formula. So one of the things when we created it, well, let's find mechanisms that would be complementary and make sure we're covering the bases. We love the idea of redundancy because redundancy is super important. So often a slightly different compound. So quercetin and luteolin are almost identically uh, identical compounds. They're both yellow. They're both polyphenols. There's one chemical difference between the two. But that difference makes it so luteolin is also a bit more active no, no. in the brain as an example. So we we put both, right? Like so we wanted to have a range of of different compounds. So we have nine different plant compounds in qualiocenolytic because they do mechanistically slightly different things, getting that toggle should I shouldn't yeah. I to work. They also work slightly differently in different tissues. And I mentioned just in passing earlier that senescent cells should be thought of more as a category then is all the exact same thing. So, you know, that's, you know, that original quercetin work just because it was a senescent cell didn't mean quercetin would be as active. So we we wanted to also choose compounds that were active in different tissues on senescent cells in those. And so that that's really what led to, you know, the the nine different ingredients. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense and and really really uh informative. What would you say to someone who says well, I do intermittent fasting or I have a fasting protocol and experience cell cellular autophagy. And so I think I'm taken care of. Well, what's the difference between maybe the fasting approach to cellular health and something like taking a synolytic? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one we actually get a fair amount on social media. So the way I think of it, and I'm oversimplifying, but this is useful. So when a cell is stressed, depending on its resilience, and the amount of stress, different things might happen. So with the lowest level, what it will do is try to adapt to that stress, right? So typically the most routine thing you would see is its antioxidant defenses would be upregulated to deal with stress because all stress at a cellular level at some point causes oxidative stress. So its defenses against that would go up. Um, a few other things, but if there was more stress than that, it would start to take some damage. And damage would mean the organelles within it, because you know you have the mitochondria, which there might be hundreds to thousands of mitochondria within a cell. There'll be you know the organelles that make new cells, right? That do things with DNA and RNA and you name it. So there's all these structures inside cells. They'll start to be damaged a bit, mm -hmm. right? And so autophagy is something that is that next level up of a stress response. It recycles those damaged things inside cells. Right? It's it. a recycling recycling and repair mechanism, so fundamentally. Senescence means there's been now enough damage that the cell is unrepairable. So let's no, make, make sure it doesn't make new copies of itself because we don't want to make copies of an unrepairable cell. So senescence is like the next thing along that stress. So even more stress than autophagy would cause damage inside, now maybe cause damage to the entire cell. You know, So think like a, uh, maybe you know, some sun exposure, you know, there was a need now for autophagy, but crazy high blistering sunburn, you probably cause some senescent cells, right? Real. Autophagy is just not going to be enough. You got to get rid of that cell. And then apoptosis is that final stage of, okay, like now we've, we know we want to, you know, end the life cycle of this cell. 
and that's a really organized process. It's called programmed cell death, right? It, it's it's almost executed in anticipation of fracturing the cell apart. Oh, right. And for whatever reason, a senescent cell should have gone through that, but didn't, right? It's lingered. It's resisting that. And so depending on like a given stress could cause any of those, depending on the amount and, you know, if something's already an Achilles heel for us, right? Like it's already a weak area, you know, maybe instead of causing, you know, damage that autophagy could remedy, those became senescent. Right. So, so autophagy is super important. Like maybe the easiest way to think of it, it's an anti-senescence program. It's something that would prevent cells from becoming senescence. But once they're senescent, then autophagy is just not sufficient. If, if anything, autophagy then is going to make it so that cell could linger more, right? Sure. <laughs> but the other interesting thing, every compound in qualiocenolytic also supports autophagy. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's just the nature of, you know, what many of these plant compounds like fisetin, quercetin, they're plant, they're they're made by plants in response to stress in their environment. So they tend to put a little bit of stress on our cells and often upregulate autophagy. So now getting to like the fasting. Yeah. So intermittent fasting, which is maybe the most common fasting in, you know, people that would follow Neurohacker follow you, you know, so that, you know, restricting eating to a time window, that will start to upregulate autophagy for sure, by the end of, you know, like that fasting period. Um, but to really upregulate autophagy significantly, you know, you have to go a couple days, right? right? You know, right. so it's the the Walter Longo fasting mimicking diet. And then his diet, they've looked at senescent immune cells. And after, you know, in that three to five day window, you start to um, prune away some senescent immune cells with that prolonged fasting, but intermittent fasting just wouldn't be long enough. Sure. You have to really signal strongly to the cell, almost famine before mm-hmm. it's going to you know, do things. And then there's no certain, no one's looked at it yet just because it's hard to measure senescent cells. It, it requires biopsies. Right. No one's really looked at the prolonged fasting to see, does it work in every tissue or is it just the immune cells or maybe is it doing something in adipose tissue? So it's it's kind of unknown. And so the way I would think of it would be more like that exercise portfolio. I, yeah. you know, let's, let's just think of fasting maybe as, you know, weight training and taking a senolytic as yoga. Like maybe we would want to do both. Sure. Mm-hmm. No, that's, yeah, that makes that's sense. really great. And at least I think there's so many people who, who don't fast or choose not to fast at all. If you've got, you know, me- a metabolic recovery protocol that you're on, you may not want to be in long bouts of calorie deficits. Yeah. And for fertile women, like I intermittent fasted for a year in my late 20s because I heard Ben Greenfield talking about it. And, uh, you know, Ben Greenfield is very, he has a different body than a 27 year old, you know, fertile female. And uh, yeah, I trashed my hormones pretty darn quick. Because I was like, oh, fasting is good. Okay, I'm going to do it for a year straight. Just like, I'm like embarrassed to even talk about it now. But I I, I was not, it was, it was a net negative for me. And um, I think that it's something that, you know, gets thrown out there as this blanket solution for a lot of people, which I'm not saying that there are, aren't benefits. I think that there are. But I think that we have to be smart. We have to be strategic, especially if, you know, and you're in different phases of life, um, you know, a, a woman who's breastfeeding is not, you know, I would not advise to do intermittent fasting that way. Um, it's It should be almost like prescriptive, you know, not just like a blanket thing that everyone should and c- could do. Yeah. So I definitely see this as being a really, really supportive option yeah. for people who are, who are maybe not into yeah. fasting. Yeah. Um, what are you hearing from people as far as what they're feeling? Um, after having taken it, obviously you guys have heard from me, uh, my body felt better my sleep was deeper, um, generally felt more like vitality, uh, not tangibly, not like an overwhelming amount, like you would take with like pre-workout or something, but it was more of a sustained energy, uh, level that was higher than having previously taken it. But, but what are you guys hearing from, from folks? So I, I mean, I'll, start just by sharing what we've seen in a couple of small studies we've done we have a a larger placebo one ongoing now but it's um it'll probably be the new year before i have results from that but our original one what we did is we selected people with some degree of joint challenges already 
just because that seemed like the easiest area for us to see if we were making a difference. And so what we saw, and this was after three dosing cycles. So a dosing cycle is the two days with then some gap before you take yeah. the next quality analytic. So we did three three dosing cycles. So the equivalent of six days of taking the product over what was at that point, five weeks, we wanted to condense the time a little bit. Normally, I, I would take the six doses over three months. Sure. Um, but what we saw was about a 50% decrease in you know issues with flexibility, challenges with things like, you know, you know, uncomfort, right? Like sore joints, you know, walking upstairs, you know, it, you you know, getting in and out of cars, carrying groceries, a lot of the things like you had mentioned, um, you know, but yours is more, you know, is more exercised in doing do, like, so that was our first. And then we did a second study where we used a questionnaire, it's called SF36, but it's a general health questionnaire that has six big buckets so you know we saw big improvements in the what would be the vitality bucket, that, that would be that sense of energy we saw uh, the biggest change in emotional health that just shocked us we didn't really expect that but that was but you know inflammation has such an impact on sure. our mood right well, so then. that was an area um we saw you know general health um and then like a good friend of mine and Part of the reason, like I think of this as, you know, it, we're all snowflakes where senescent cells may be most um, challenging to me versus like a good friend of mine could be very different. Sure, yeah. So for him, you know, he's his birthday is two days after mine. So, you know, almost identical age. He's fantastic shape. Like physically, you look at him, it's like, you know, envious, like he doesn't even have to train hard and he stays like lean and hard. right yeah and he always has right he was like a you know a state champion wrestling back when he was younger um but he he and his partner foster dogs and what he found after a few cycles of qualia analytic he could all of a sudden comfortably throw a ball or a stick which he hadn't no. been able to do for years no. so something in that rotator cuff like something cleared there whether it was analytic or not that contributed to that we don't know but it was the only thing he changed so I actually just was in um, Las Vegas. That's where he lives. And I asked him, oh, I'm going to stay at your house. What Qualia products do you want me to bring? He's like, oh, just Qualia Synolytic. <laughs> bring <laughs> as much as, as you want. So I brought him four boxes. So that's how it initially showed up for him. But it could vary for, like, for me, one of the things I tracked initially was my weight training. Because I, you know, I would track each workout, how much I lift, how many repetitions. And, you know, it, it, often we get kind of stuck or plateaued. And what I noticed very quickly, and this was about a year and a half ago that Qualiacinolytic launched, is it unstuck me. That, you know, whether mm. it was mental, whether it was yeah. physical, like all of a sudden, like I jumped up quite a bit. And and I, I use the X3 bar by Jakish as my oh, nice. main yeah. go-to for that. And I, I think it was, you know, on that black strap, which is the heaviest of the four you got, I was stuck somewhere in the low 20s on the bench press motion and jumped up like five or six. So it was a big delta the same yeah. sort of squat motion so you know like for me that was what i was interested in because i didn't have other things that i thought you know i didn't have the joint or that like a you know a physical inflammation thing but i was like oh will this help my muscle tissue because i've always been somewhat of a, a slow gainer muscle tissue and, and i think it was because when i first started lifting weights i way overtrained back sure. in my yeah. 20s and then I was at the time in the Navy, sleep deprived, body clock disrupted, eating a, a yeah. horrible diet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I totally get that. I've, I've thought that myself in, in many cases. Walk me through why two days a month um, or 30 days roughly in between taking Qualius Analytic. And then could you ever or would you ever say take it more frequently or less? So the original... Mayo Clinic, Scripps Institute of Aging work at the time, since they were using a stack that had, you know, a pretty powerful immunomodulator, felt like, okay, well, maybe the best risk reward is what they termed hit and run dosing. Let's just do a big dose for a couple days and then have a, a reset period. And that their feeling was that would give the best risk reward for this new technology fundamentally. So that's the largely been adapt adopted, right? And the way I would think of it would be again going back to that pruning metaphor. If you were to prune a plant every day, you'd yeah, yeah. you know, kill yeah. the poor thing. Right. Right. But if you 
prune it strategically once a month, you'll make the, the plant healthier. So that approach still makes sense to me. It's still how the field approaches things, whether it's, you know, um, there's quite a few ongoing studies just using fisetin alone as a senolytic and all of them are designed with that intermittent dosing. Um, so, you know, a two days, sometimes you'll see a three day, but generally that's, that's the window to take it. Um, and another reason for that is like, say the, the products work really well and cause now some of these senescent cells to go through apoptosis. Well, we have cells going through apoptosis all the time, all the time, right? Like tens of billions in a day. It's possible that we could overload that, right? Because the immune system still now needs to gobble up the debris. And if we cause too much debris too fast, uh, maybe we overactivate the immune system. Yeah, so that was well. another idea. So fundamentally, it was thought like this would be the best way to approach it if we want to be maximally safe. Got it. That makes right? sense. And then in terms of like, is it, you know, cool to do it more frequently than just, you know, two doses and then wait till next month. So in our small studies, we are doing that. And mostly that's for compliance. It's a lot harder to, to get someone to do something, you know, over 90 days sure. than to do, you know, say over five weeks. Um, so two weeks between, so well, I guess 12 days between, but, you know, take it on a weekend, wait a full week and then till the next weekend and do another cycle, perfectly fine. And if I was in practice still seeing someone with, like as an example, a lot of joint health issues, I'd probably have them start on that more rapid protocol for at least the first three dosing cycles just to you know get them um, healthier, faster and feeling better, faster. Um, in terms of last, you know, if I was say personally, you know, 28, 30, when I first got out of the Navy, it was at University of Hawaii, I probably would take quality once a, a quarter okay. at that point, right? I don't, I don't need to prune as aggressively, you know, it would be unusual for someone that age to have a lot of senescent cells. So a, a less frequent pruning is more than likely sufficient. And once you get to, you know, late 30s or 40s, like once a month is probably the sweet spot. Okay. The same if you were, like if you were going to do an inter, not a an, uh, intermittent fast, but like a more prolonged fast, you know, maybe you decide to do it once a quarter, once a year, depending on your health, your, you know, age, things like right. that. Right, right. I'm thinking selfishly for me, I had two back-to-back -back, um, ACL reconstructions in high school. And generally my knee does not bother me. Like I can still deadlift, I can still squat, but every now and then it will bother me for whatever reason where it just feels just feels weak where i need to be more careful and I'm, I'm being more mindful of my movements and how i'm getting out of the car and landing or you know doing box jumps or something like that so it's generally fine but i i'm curious i know that there's scar tissue built up in there there's some numb spots still from 15 years ago probably more at this point yeah yeah um and so I'm, I'm wondering for me, I, I took it this morning and I'm going to continue taking it. But if you were advising me with like knee, um, it's not so much the joint. It, for me, it was the ACL, MCL, like ligamental structures. Um, what are your thoughts there? Uh, generally, um, open to you know run any new experiments and then just pay attention. So I would be you know comfortable, if, you know, say if you wanted to do you know, the three dosing cycles over five weeks instead of over three months. Like, yeah, let's do it. Let's just pay attention to see how you're doing. And, you know, maybe it'll you know, speed things up. And then at that point, we go back to once a month. Okay. So, okay. Um, so like every two weeks? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like I said, that would be the most like close together I would yeah. do. Um, but we've done that, you know, now in enough people that I'm very comfortable with it. And okay. joints just tend to be an area like... This is a somewhat of a um, oversimplification, but the three cell types that are most or originally were thought to be the most prone to becoming senescent and still believed to be are um, immune cells, right? So that would be one. Um, endothelial cells, right? The things that lie in our blood vessels, lymph, and then fibroblasts. And fibroblasts are the connective tissue cells, right? So ligaments, knee joints, skin, like, you know, between organs. And so you know, those are the ones that typically I think will also be the, the first addressed and the, the, you know, the most accessible for senolytics to get to.
Well, so, mm-hmm. you know, if there's an issue in one of those areas, then being a little bit more aggressive initially, I think is fine. If, you know, if like for me, I there wasn't something tangibly I could say, oh, like, will this change if I do them more aggressively? Then at that point, you know, just go the once a month. If that makes yeah. sense. All right. I'm going to experiment a little bit. Yeah. My, my my last question on on the product um, would just be, is this not for anybody specifically? Um, as well as, are there considerations you would suggest people make for the ingredients and whether or not they should pay attention to what else they may be taking in case there's some level of maybe it's duplication that's not necessary and or some level of contraindications, contraindications you know, mixing of a host of different ingredients or supplements or even prescription medication. What are your warnings or disclaimers? <laughs> yeah. So um, pregnancy, early childhood would definitely be no-nos for senolytic compounds. So, so this would be how, you know, we at Neurohacker think about it. There's transient senescent cells and there's lingering ones. So transient ones do good things, but go away really quickly. They, you know, fundamentally throw themselves out of the refrigerator. <laughs> The lingering ones are what we've been talking about. But senolytic compounds that we use in quite senolytic really are targeted on the lingering ones. But that aside, we'd like to take an abundance of caution. So pregnancy be, would be one of those. Pregnancy, childhood development, there's transient senescent cells that come in waves, do good things, and then throw themselves out of the refrigerator, as an example. When we have an acute injury, as an example, they, tissue damage or something like that, we also tend to make some of the transient senescent cells. So like immediately following, you know, like some you know surgery or something like that, you know, wait, you know, two weeks before you would do, you know, any senolytic, Ew. you know, and then things are senolytic because, you know, like they're a compound like defisotin or quercetin, but at the, that they need a certain dose to really be expected to have that effect. So, um, for most things, like, you know, many people take um, quercetin. That would be probably of the things in quiocinolytic among, you know, the most common people would take a reasonably high dose that starts to get into that, um, like bordering in the senolytic. So we would be comfortable with that stacked with quiocinolytic. And most okay. people are taking quercetin when they do it daily for some, you know, sure. some reason, right? Um, so there's n- nothing that I would say, you know, in terms of what you're doing currently, if you do curcumin from turmeric or quercetin, that would be a problem. Um, in part, just because what we're asking you to do is just those two days a month. And what I would usually say if a, you know, if social media or customer service asked me, yeah, just tell, tell those people for those two days, just do our product the rest of the month, you know, you know, continue doing whatever is working for them. Guys, if this piques your interest at all, I really encourage you to check yeah. this product out. You'll have likely heard an ad by now because yeah. we'll have inserted it into this episode um but definitely go to neurohacker.com we're huge fans of a host of different products we already mentioned quality of mind the, both the caffeinated version as well as the non-caffeinated i personally love the product of resilience um and then we have been loving the qualia senolytic and uh, you can use our our discount code that is the medicine t-h-e-m-e-d-i-c-i-n we'll have the link in the show notes uh, but I highly encourage everybody to try it, um, but also check it out. Hit us up with any questions that you may have. We'll definitely pass them on to Greg and the Merrill Hacker team. We can't answer them ourselves, um, but this has just been a blast. Yeah, I, I've, I've just learned, learned so, much. so much. Yeah, it's been great. And yeah, we're so grateful. And I know our listeners are too for you guys creating products that are small actions for hopefully, you know, long-term stackable benefits over the course of our life. And that's that's what we're all about. Well, thank you. And I just want to thank both. Of, well, um, Chase for mentioning quality resilience. It's one of like internally our favorite products. For whatever reason, it hasn't found the audience yet. That's something like quality mind has. But, you know, going back to that camel game last straw thing, right? That product was intentionally made to build resilience and it, it works really well. So, you know, it, it maybe a few people listening will yeah. decide that's a product for me because I, I love that product as well. I recommended that to a host of different friends who have stress in their life and uh, the stress that is now manifesting in a host of different issues, sleep, uh, sexual vitality. And this is the, you know, these are, these are oftentimes 
people who've been hustling and grinding through their 20s and they're running into their 30s and hitting these brick walls and going, what the hell? I've been doing all the things. And also thinking about having kids. Right. And and so often, at least in my journey, it's been stress. And even if I sleep, I may not be hitting those deep sleep uh, marks that I need to be. I'm not waking up with the level of uh, vitality, abundance that I'm I'm prone to when when feeling optimal. And uh, oddly enough, it's been taking something like uh, resilience that's been just enough to nudge me back into a place where I find um, vitality. So yeah, absolutely huge fan of that product. Uh, we've talked about it as we've had conversations around stress on on the podcast. And yeah, I, I hope it does well because I, I hope you guys keep it around. I'm going to probably buy some right after yeah. <laughs> end of this conversation because uh, I'm needing some support with with uh, sleep these days anyway. So anything else, uh, Dr. Greg, anything else that you want to bring up? No, I would just say for people that feel like they would want to learn a lot more of in the weeds, why we chose each ingredient in Qualia Synolytic, there's a, a, a I, I do a blog for every product called the formulator's view. So that's, it's called a synolytic, the formulator's view of the ingredients, something like that. Um, on our website, that goes a lot more into what senescence is, synolytics, and then each ingredient and why we chose it and how it works. So for the the you know more, oh, I want to like understand yeah. more, that's available to people. Perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get that from you and we'll put it in the show notes. And where else can people find more from you? Because I know you've, you've written a lot and you you uh, have a book, at least uh, at least one that I'm aware of. Where can people find more of, of your work? Yeah, I mostly I just blog, you know, on the neurohacker.com website. Um, you know, our social media person on Instagram is fantastic. So, you know, follow Neurohacker on that channel. That would be our main outreach. And then, um, yeah, my book, Shapeshift, I wrote about 10 years ago. And um I'm not a very promotional person, but <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm proud of it. I you know um, feel like I learned a lot writing it, and um, it was definitely a labor of love. We'll put that in the show notes too. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you so much. We enjoyed this uh, immensely, and I know our listeners did as well. And you guys, if you enjoyed this episode, go check out Neurohacker, check out Synalytic, Qualia Mind. Like honestly, we have nothing but good things to say about this company the integrity, and now you know how much they researched each individual ingredient they put in each one of their products. Send this episode to someone you love, someone you know, share it on your story. We appreciate you so much. Go spread some light. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that, check out right over here for some more fun clips. Oh, and you're going to want to subscribe. Bye.